Well, welcome to Issues in Rural Crime and Society, and we're here. My name is Alistair Harkness, and I'm here today with uh, with the co-director, my fellow co-director of the Centre for Rural Crum Criminology at the University of New England, and we're fortunate to be joined here today by Dr. Matt Bowden, um, who is uh, uh, become very well established in rural criminology, and uh, and welcome, Matt. Thank you, Alistair. Hi, Kyle. How are you? Thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I think we've branded this as the lay of the land of rural criminology with particular attention to, to Ireland. Can you get us started uh, talking a little bit about maybe some of the primary issues that are, that are Ireland specific in the field of rural crime and rural criminology? Uh, criminology in general is very underdeveloped here. Uh, it, it, Colleagues of mine uh, a few years back referred to it as the, uh, you know, as the, as the absent discipline. Yeah, it just hardly ever existed. Uh, about twenty years ago, it's it's it's. So I mean, I'm probably one of the first uh, wave of people who would have styled themselves as criminologists. Uh, uh, my background is in sociology, and uh, you know, I I I. I I, I drifted into I drifted into criminology by accident. <laughs> uh, so you know, criminology is, is quite underdeveloped here. It, it, it's it's it, in the last certainly in the last fifteen years things have changed when courses began to emerge uh, at master's level first and now at undergraduate level. So we have we have accelerated um, the discipline of criminology here in Ireland. We still don't have. Uh, we still don't have a society of criminology here. We have a regular conference where people from both sides of the, uh, both in Northern Ireland, which is the opposite side of the border, which is part of the UK, uh, and here in the Republic of Ireland, where we meet up on a, on a, uh, a regular basis and have, uh, we have a, a conference. It's supposed to run on an annual basis, but it hasn't run for a few years, largely because of COVID. So is it fair to say, Matt, that, um, that yourself and your PhD student at a, uh, pretty much the only rural criminologist in in the republic. Yeah, yeah, I think I think we, yeah, I think that's uh, that that would be fair to say. But uh, uh, I mean that doesn't that doesn't mean that people haven't been doing interesting work. That uh, um, I mean there there's some well established rural sociologists uh, and rural anthropologists uh, here in Ireland. So. Uh, 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 who, who may have who may have dabbled into or have uh, encroached into the kind of criminological space, but uh, in, in general, uh, you know, the work that Arthur and I are doing, I think, is uh, must must be among the, the kind of first concentrated effort to do some work in, in rural, specifically within rural criminology. So you and Arthur have been publishing a little bit together over, you know, in the International Journal of Rural Criminology and, uh, and some other stuff. Do you want to tell us a little bit about some of the, the work that you've been doing together that sort of dovetails, I guess, with, um, with his um, PhD project? Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I, I think that we, we, we were really interested in uh, things like crime prevention and security and most especially urban security. I mean, all of the work I've done up to about five years ago was in the, in the area of urban, urban crime prevention or urban security. I wasn't really interested in the rural at all. And yet there was, there was this huge gap, you know, where people were not focused on the rural. And so Arthur and myself, uh, during a, you know, during what was seemed to be some kind of a crisis in rural areas uh, where the work was a, a spate of very, very high profile uh, attacks in rural areas. Uh, we, we became interested in the whole area of, 
of rural security and, and rural crime uh, and rural crime prevention. Uh, because there was this very highly emotionally charged atmosphere around it and we wanted to try and find out a little bit more about that. So the first thing we did was we looked at this, we, we, we looked at how crime was entering public discourse in rural areas. And we did a, a very kind of uh, preliminary study taking soundings from people in a small rural town in the southwest of Ireland um, about, about their concerns about crime. And so that was our first entry, if you like, into, in, into rural criminology. Uh, and we published that article eventually in the International Journal of Rural Criminology. And we were interested in the whole idea of crime talk. You know, how, how does crime enter into people's consciousness? And how do they begin to talk about it? And, and you know, what are the concerns about it? And uh, uh, we, we noticed some subtle differences between whether you were a rural uh, whether you were locally or indigenous to the rural area or whether you were a newcomer. Newcomers uh, adopted this idea that crime was an everyday fact because they had experience of living elsewhere where crime was a little bit more prolific, whereas rural areas saw it as a sign. Sorry, people indigenous to rural areas seem to be saying that uh, it, it's a sign that the area is going down or a sign that, the, that there's a decline. Um, um, so that's what we think we were uh, I think that's what we were researching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And to a large degree, it, it depends on um, your perspective from where you're coming from, doesn't it? So if you yeah, um, yeah. if you are, if you if you live in a uh, in a rural area and a yeah. one one noisy motorbike comes past, that uh, that's startling. But if you live in a really urbanised, uh, noisy environment, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't even notice any of that sound. I live near a um, a railway line. You know you the big goods train, freight train comes through in the middle of the night, blows its whistle and it's noisy. I wouldn't hear it. It doesn't wake me up, but people have visited. It's sort of the train's noisy. It's all about perspective, isn't it? Um, and as you say, those people well, I mean, newly, newly arriving in a particular area are going to have different um, and starkly different perspectives. Yeah. But I think there are some real, I think there are some real issues that go beyond perception. Like, so for example, uh, here in Ireland, uh, Rural drug use is a is a is, a, is an issue that has you know uh, come to attention in the last ten years. Uh, whereas previously, you know, the idea of you know drug, drugs being supplied or even taken being taken in rural areas was something that was just not heard of, uh, and it's become particularly problematic in some sm small rural towns. And uh, so, I mean, that's a, that's an established fact because we know from people looking for help from the, the data that's available for, for kind of treatment. Uh, uh, the treatment statistics show that the, there has been, there has been some change in rural areas. Is that, uh, is that so there is a, sorry, there is is that, a feeling is that, that that among, amongst rural dwellers, there is a feeling amongst rural dwellers, Alistair, sorry, there is a feeling amongst them that the urban is encroaching on the rural. Mm. Yeah. And that comes along with things like commuting, better transport, uh, people even coming up to Dublin to buy drugs and then going back down by train or whatever, you know, uh, and that's that's certainly a feature that that's certainly an issue that we've become aware of in recent years. And so there 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 there, there, there are definitely some objective changes that are going on. It's not just perception. Um, I was just going to ask. I wonder whether that's also linked to any economic change that might be happening in those rural communities. Um, factories closing down. Uh, some of the other. Yeah. Uh, associated impacts with um, with the engagement with Europe and the rest of the world, and whether that's having a, a direct impact on rural communities, and therefore an uptake in, in drug use and abuse. Yeah, the systematic review that I did with Katinka and Natalie Thomas on drug uh, risk factors, the rural risk environment, we called it for drug use, uh, borrowing from other authors. Uh, that was one of the primary. Uh, outcomes of that systematic review was industrial decline, along with a number of other factors, um, such as access to transportation, um, uh, pro-social, or sorry, pro-drug uh, using subcultures and things like that. But rural decline seemed to be framed uh, uh, much in that regard. And alongside that, a lot of the physical uh, industries found in rural spaces and the use of drugs as a means to cope with the side effects and implications of that, whether it be actual uh, pain and things like that. I mean, I'm sure you weren't just looking at opiates, I presume, Kyle. We were, sorry, I should have been very clear. We had to, 
Uh, we tried to look at drugs, uh, broadly speaking, and that uh, would have been thousands yeah. and thousands of articles. So we looked at And so what were the primary factors there um, contributing to actually, sorry, overdose deaths specifically? Um, the rationale for looking at that being the fact that uh, overdose deaths in rural spaces are much higher for opioid use. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's, uh, the whole emergence of the polydrug, uh, uh, polydrug use as, a, as, a, as an issue here has, has overtaken opiate use. We had uh, problems in urban areas going back to the late 70s. And we had a peak of a heroin epidemic in poor areas in Dublin uh, in the mid-1980s. And then we had a second peak in around the early to mid-90s or so. Uh, and, and rural areas were completely unaffected by that. Uh, we associate, I suppose, come to associate heroin use with, with economic decline, uh, whereas we associate polydrug use with mass consumption. So there, there are, you know, there, there are two very, very different, two very different uh, sets of culture that 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 that, that, that drives them. Um, and they have they have very very different effects. The polydrug economy here we're, we're we're experiencing is incredibly violent, uh, whereas the the heroin heroin supply and distribution was a little bit more muted in comparison. Even though it was you know just as just as lucrative as a as a you know as an organised criminal enterprise. I know Matt that you've taken a um, you've. Your interest has been sparked and peaked uh, recently with um, issues around elder abuse, and I'm just wondering what has um, sparked that um, that interest and and where, how you see it as a as an issue, particularly in Ireland, but perhaps Europe and and globally uh, more generally. And what are uh, what are some of the sorts of gaps that um, that might need to be filled by people, particularly when we're focusing on these matters in a in a rural space. Uh, I, 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 I'm not exactly sure what the answer to that is, uh, Alistair, to be, to be quite frank. I, I, uh, it, 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 it's very striking that there is, there's a, there's a, that there's such a gap there that we, we know very little about it. That's, that's what really gets me. Uh, every bit as much as the issue itself. Uh, and it is, it is, it is a critical issue, I think. Uh, I mean, one of, one of the one of the reasons that piques my interest is that the vulnerability, of, particularly of rural farmers um, and rural dwellers in general, who don't have access to, to things like banks, or who have less and less access to things like banks, and who may be you know particularly people of the older generation who are less interested in things like your, the internet and banking online, and they just don't get the abstract nature of the system. Everything about the way in which older people have operated. They've operated in the tangible world of, you know, cash and paper. Uh, we're, you know, we're operating in the abstract world of, you know, near money and credit cards and, you know, online banking and all that kind of thing. I think, I think that gives a particular vulnerability to, uh, to elder abuse who, uh, sorry, to, to, el to, to elderly people, to older people who may be, uh, you know, you know, holding cash in particular ways and that just exposes them to a whole range of risks around that uh, uh, i also think that you know it's a very it's a very subtle uh it's a very subtle uh, area it's in the sense that you know abuse as you know through things like coercive control can be you know can be you know very very kind of psychological in its nature and it may be uh, it may be down to things like emotional blackmail and all these kinds of things. And so I, I, I know very little about this topic, uh, but I, I, I think uh, looking at it through a rural lens is a really important thing, thing to do because I think that people who live in rural areas you know, come with an extra set of vulnerabilities. We have, we, have, we, have a, we, have a, we have a phenomenon here known as the bachelor farmer, you know, uh, you know the farmer who never farmer who never married and lives in a very remote area and you know uh, uh, you know 
there are not that many of them I would I would imagine now but um, you know they, 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 they live in very very isolated settings and uh, uh, I, I think that's a, a particularly vulnerable group that we, we we need to be mindful of their experiences and their needs so that's that's really piqued my interest I suppose in the whole area of elder abuse we have a, um, a TV show that comes all around each year here in Australia called Farmer Wants a Wife, and uh, <laughs> and um, it's really about trying to there's a bit of matchmaking and trying to give the farmers um, that companionship. But just on some of those issues around age differences, I um I did a couple of focus groups um, a few years ago in the western part of uh, the state of Victoria where I am, and um and. Uh, I, I chatted to a group of dairy farmers and they were age 45 and over and then a group of younger farmers. The younger farmers had gone off and gone, uh, got some tertiary education, they got business degrees, ag agro-commerce agri degrees and so on and so forth and were thinking really strategically and all of the information and technology that they put into their business, you know, what, you know, the monitoring of the weight of the cows on a daily basis and measuring the yields and whatnot. Uh, but it was just a way forms of communication. So the older people, the, their form of communicating with each other was winding down the window of the ute as they're driving past or catching up on a Saturday night at the football club, whereas the young blokes are um, all on their WhatsApp and their um, messaging and there's a, um, that sort of that online form of communication as well. So when it comes to sort of elder abuse, there's those issues around the way that people communicate too and, and some of those starkly different ways that people will um, will speak and talk and interact and what no and whatsoever in um, in those rural settings yeah just look at our respective surveys Alistair's Victorian farm crime survey was hard copy mine was uh, in the age of COVID an online survey and the yep. age differences between the responses is quite significant uh, uh, by almost a generation or at least a 10, 15 year age gap. Mine obviously being skewed much younger and much more female than, than Alistair's uh, hard copy survey. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what you're probably offering here, Matt, is a call to arms, if you like, because when we're thinking around things like, um, um, elder abuse, uh, child abuse, specifically in rural spaces, hate crime in rural spaces. There's not a great deal of uh, researchers uh, doing work in this space, specifically thinking about um, aspects of geography. I don't know, Rachel Hale and myself are working on a, um, on a book on rural victims and, and edits collection and, and trying to get, um, trying to find some people who have actually been doing some empirical work in the space or would be, would be keen to in the future. Uh, those people are few and far between. So I really think there is a call to arms. At this point in the development of rural criminology as its own sub-discipline, growing as it is, but there are still so many gaps that need to be filled in in, um, in filling that knowledge. Absolutely. I mean, there are, there, there are, there are very... Uh, there's also a critical issue, I think, that we need to uh, delve into in a very, very deep way, and that's the whole meaning of land. Uh, land here, land is very, very, runs very deep within people's consciousness and uh, disputes over land spill over into the most horrific, heinous murders uh, and uh, the most tragic, the most tragic of, of, of cases uh, in recent years that we've seen here uh, have involved, uh, you know, uh, uh, murder suicides and all these kinds of things are really, really, you know, they're really, really trying. But the the the, the issue of land and the, and the uh, and the meaning of it and the attachment that people have to it is critical. Now, I I'm not so sure that that's necessarily the same elsewhere, but it may well be. It, it may be in certain post-colonial contexts that. It, Would you suggest that is? tied to specific Irish history and political culture it's, uh, now? Would, uh, definitely it is, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's more, the land is more than just a commodity. It's more than just mm -hmm. a, uh, its property value. It actually holds a lot of deep meanings for people in their habitus. And uh, I, 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 I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an important area of study also for rural criminology there. Uh, and how it, how it, how it, 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 it es you know, disputes over land especially can escalate into the most horrible and horrific crimes. We had a case a couple of years ago of a farmer 
driving a, 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 a baler. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you call it everywhere else, but it's like it's like an attachment you put on the front of a tractor with two big, like a fork. It's like a two-pronged fork. I'm not sure what that's called. Showing my rural ignorance here, but uh, he drove this into the into the car, the oncoming car of another farmer, and killed him. And uh, the guy died of the most horrific injuries, obviously, from the effects of this this thing being driven through the side of his car. Um, uh, so you know, think, and that was over. That was over a, a silly local dispute about using a crowbanger which is a device that's used for scaring crows away from till recently tilled land. So uh, I, 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 this is an area I think that we, you know, I, I certainly would love to, to explore a little bit more, but it has something to do with a kind of deep, it's something to do with the deep layer, the deep meaning of, of something like land uh, and what that, what that means to people and how much they invest in it. And, uh, how it's ingrained in their ingrained in the fibre of their of, of their sense of being, you know. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily need to relate to um, uh, actual violence either. There was a situation not that long ago here in Australia where a, a, a very large multinational but Australian-based um, mining company um, detonated some um, uh, land in Western Australia and happened to take out some caves which had Indigenous. Um, paintings and, and so on. So high level of cultural attachment to this particular space. You know, this, this has existed for 40 something thousand years and within the space of um, minutes and a stick of gel ignite, um, it's all gone for good. Um, so the, the ramifications from that uh, will be long, long felt and because of that cultural attachment to, uh, to, to, to land. Yeah, and going back to your environment, climate and crime comments earlier on, there's also that that issue of property rights and identification with one's right to do as they wish with their own property. And I know historically here in Australia, one leading to to a particular death uh, around compliance and you know refusal to comply with uh, particularly land clearing uh, uh, rules and, and things like that. And so you can see that kind of visceral attachment to one's right to do and uh, do as they please, I guess, with their own, their own land and that attachment to the land um, is much more than an economic attachment. And in addition to the attachment yes. to the land, it's the impacts on the land that are felt. So, you know, coal seam gas extraction and fracking leads to some quite curious people getting involved in protest movements. We had what were called yep. the knitting nanas, you know, um, yep. elderly ladies going and, and staging sit-ins and, and knitting and doing some of that craftism, some of the stuff that Elise McGovern Mm. At the University of uh, Sydney here in Australia. Um, New South Wales. The University of New South Wales um, does a lot of uh, inquiry into and sort of um, some of these things, particularly when it has corporate interests with lots of power and uh, profit motivations, can actually have huge amounts of impact on people in their, in their local rural spaces. Yeah. I guess that probably leads on to a conversation we can probably have around the Anthropocene and... Uh, and yeah, yeah. That as well. <laughs> yeah, this is a this is an area that I, again I've I've re only recently come to, to 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 know about through colleagues of mine who are uh, you know working in this area who are uh, primarily in in the arts and are interested in the arts and the Anthropocene, you know, and uh, uh, so that 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 that's what's got me interested in it. Um, and it it also uh, uh, I've I've read some of the works that Clifford Shearing has done on uh, the Anthropocene, and it's certainly it's certainly a critical area I think for for future study, particularly as it as it as it begins to transform, it becomes the dynamic that begins to transform rural spaces, um, um, and adapting to the Anthropocene I think is is. Of becoming aware of it, even uh, is a is a critical issue for criminology generally. But I, I think there's a there's a specific there's a specific uh, uh, rich seam of work that needs to be done around it in rural criminology in particular because uh, of the very you know particular nature of transformation that's going to happen in rural areas. 
you know, it's going to impact on things like things like fishing. It's going to impact on you know kind of arable land use, uh, uh, energy. Uh, you know, like uh, you know, the use of land for energy generation for wind, especially, um, uh, or in solar. The way in which rural spaces may be turned into kind of large photovoltaic farms <laughs> instead of arable farms for for energy, and that's 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 something I think that. that well, they're, they're, they're good in theory. What does it mean for people who live in, what does it mean also for uh, species uh, who have enjoyed, uh, you know, living in kind of unadulterated, uh, non-industrialized non spaces, yeah? you know, for animals and for, uh, for wildlife. Um, so I think I think this is an area that 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 that, that criminologists, especially rural criminologists, should be should be keenly interested in. Yeah, there's a bit of an overlap, isn't there, between sort of the rural criminology and the green criminology? Some of that stuff that Gorat yeah. Smashko and Rob White do, and particularly around water, yeah. and you know, with yeah. a burgeoning a, a growing population combined yeah. with a yeah. um, and so a heavy reliance on potable water, but combined also with yes. um, yeah. uh, climate change. Uh, mm -hmm. There are real pressures and real strains. You know, yeah. you know, a burgeoning middle class in um, in in some of our developing countries around the world, and the, and and demands for protein production. So it needs lots of land, lots of water. I can't remember the statistic: how many liters of water it takes to produce a uh, a liter of milk, or how many liters of water it takes to produce a a, uh, a steak. You know, in the butcher's shop there, but uh, it's a lot. Um, and so obviously all those extra pressures and that then leads to um, offending behaviours and further victimisations as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I think it's interesting as well to think about the, uh, what it means for the policing of rural spaces. Australia is a case in point. I've never been in a country, <laughs> lived in a country that's experienced, uh, ha had mother nature throw so much at it in such a short time since I've been here for three years from drought to floods to, to rampant bushfires and what that means for disaster management and security yeah. and policing yeah. in rural spaces is yeah. completely, uh, I think we're very much behind the eight ball on those issues. Um, I'll yeah. take the opportunity to plug our colleagues, uh, a special issue. Tariro, uh, our colleague at UNE, along with Clifford Shearing and, and Jared Blaustein, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, have a special issue on policing the Anthropocene in policing and society. Um, and abstracts are still open until the 14th of this month. So if you've got some burning paper on that issue, I highly uh, recommend getting something in there. But yeah, I think that's watching, uh, particularly as an outsider and a stranger to Australia, um, yeah, the, the sheer ferocity of Mother Nature here with, with drought, with uh, the um, almost ironically throwing floods at the farmers uh, uh, right after that. And, and uh, again, what, is that, what that has meant, um, not only the broader scheme of things like farmer mental health and these types of issues, but just disaster management and security uh, generally. And I've had conversations with the, with the New South Wales police about this and, you know, you've, you've you bet that they they are thinking about this and, and they are on it because they know it's a it is a future problem and it's a, a, almost a, an inevitable future problem. Yeah, I think different different groups of people are going to adapt to this differently. Uh, some are going to be uh, some of us uh, who understand these things at a, a level that we've you know come to. We've, we're familiar with the kind of conceptual, and have the conceptual skills perhaps to be able to deal with uh, what this means. Uh, there, we, we, the rest of the population may not have that, don't necessarily have access to that. You know, uh, we, we can think abstractly and we understand uh, the implications of what this has for humanity more generally. Uh, but there are groups of people who are going to push back against this. We've already seen this in the US, for example, where Trump mobilized this kind of, or, you know, not, not, not only rural, but a huge rural population in America were mobilized by Trump and uh, 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 around, uh, you know, being, being, being con contrary to uh, pro climate change, you know, we're against kind of this idea, you know, and, uh, you know, he, 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 he got elected by promising people that we would return to extractive industries like coal. 
you know, and steel and all these things. You know. uh, there's got to be huge pushback uh, 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 against against any kind of change or pol- you know policies that are brought in by this by 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 states to address climate change. Uh, and so there there's going to be there's going to be uh, a lot of issues around. Uh, uh, I, I I think around you know protests. There's going to be political unrest uh, uh, mm-hmm. in relation to it. We haven't seen a huge amount of it here. Uh, I would have to say, but uh, uh, I, I you know there's there's already kind of a, a politics of climate change here, where rural areas are pitted against the kind of or the the urban elite who. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, it's easy for it's easy for us to change. You know, we can start recycling our our our, uh, our plastic bottles and uh, you know mm. composting and doing all these things. You know, but it's not necessarily the same for everybody else who's trying to eke a living. Oh, if you um, you know, you people don't take kindly to being lectured at about oh, you must use public transport more often by people who have a tram running past the house every five minutes to midnight. Yeah. You're yeah. um. 30 yeah. kilometres from the nearest um, um, yeah. shop. Yeah, that's already an issue. That's already a huge issue here, you know, where, uh, you know, when it comes to things like taxing cars, you know, you know that the, you have a bigger car, you know, because you need it for, if you have like an SUV and you need it for work, or whatever, you're, you're going to pay higher taxes on, on something like that. Mm. Uh, where it's okay for us living in, in urban areas, we can drive around in electric vehicles. Uh, you know, so... Yeah, we... When you think about the way politics is done, I mean, you can really understand why that rural-urban divide is is the largest, if not uh, going to be the largest political fault line across a number of areas. Um, I see it in my research in Canada as well. Just the, you look at voting patterns, measures of ideology and things like that, and the gap is just massively increasing. Um, and a lot of that, I think, has to do with sentiments of feeling left behind. Uh, much political discourse and talk is focused around the urban uh, by proxy of, of you yeah. know, concentration of individuals and votes yeah. and things like that, depending on how seats are won. Um, but it's definitely something you know, really interesting. But going back to that, something that struck me here at UNE, a, a colleague of ours in law, Tanya Howard, does a lot of stuff on environment and farmers and compliance and stuff. And... Um, I think she's written some papers on it, although I'm not hundred percent, but I know in discussing with her in the past, we've talked about how farmers are actually sometimes the greatest champions of these issues as well, because they really feel an attachment to the land uh, uh, to uh, identify as stewards of the land. And so if they believe in climate change and if they commit to that, then they very much see their, their, their role as the front and center of renewables. And, and just looking at beef week that we have going on here in Queensland right now, like a lot of the, the technologies and things like that, that a lot of it is actually geared towards reducing power consumption and, and finding ways to continue farming into the future without the pressures that are currently placed upon the environment. And so it, it is interesting to see the farmer's role in that regard and how they will identify with that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we, 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 it's, we can be reflexive. You know, we take, we take information, we take knowledge, we take science and we, we, you know, we can uh, organize our lives or reorganize our lives accordingly. Yeah. We've come, we've, we've come over the years to, to understand this as, as part of our broad education. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm not saying that farmers are, can't be reflexive. Of course, they can be. As you're saying, there's there's enlightened farmers who who uh, are well able to well able to uh, champion these issues. Um, uh, we, we have a we have a, an interesting agency here. It's called Chagask, which is the it which provides scientific information to farmers, uh, and they they've issued guidelines on how farmers can. Uh, using you know very kind of simple changes in practices can uh, reduce their carbon footprint uh, and uh, that's the kind of that's the kind of approach I think we need you know where farmers have access to this kind of information and knowledge shows that they can be reflexive themselves yeah. uh, uh, you know that doesn't touch everybody um, and there is quite a lot of pushback, but you know, having said that, that's 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 typical, I think, of an approach that needs to be taken. That people need to have access to the appropriate scientific information, uh, but also uh, given guidelines as to very simple things they can do. Uh, 
you know, uh, you know, by you know, by you know, putting wiring in certain places, you know, and, and protecting protecting uh, water, so protecting the water table, uh, these these kinds of things. I think uh, yeah. that's the way to go. There's also just the issue of whether real or perceived conflicting interests, particularly in the backdrop of the decline of certain industries. So we see it in the oil sands in Canada, you know, where entire economies are built around this type of extraction and the notion that those are going to be replaced overnight with renewables obviously scares a lot of people whose economic bottom line or, you know, generational history has relied on that. And so change is hard for anyone, let alone yes. this type of change that actually threatens one's livelihood. Yes. So yes. Yeah, the big beef industry is a multi-billion dollar industry here, multi-billion euro industry here, and it contributes a huge amount to the Irish economy. Uh, and we export huge amounts. I'm not exactly sure of the, what the, the exact figures, but we export large volumes of beef every year all over the world, but, uh, to, but to Britain and to Europe. And the quality and standard of it is very highly regarded. So it's a huge industry here. So when you have something like a Meat, a meat Free Monday campaign or something like that to raise consciousness about moving to a plant, uh, uh, a plant-based diet, uh, that generates quite a lot of tension and pushback, I think, where it clashes with material interests. Um, and yeah. so that's a space I think we're going to need to, to, to watch over the next few years. Ireland, uh, one billion in bovine meat in 2018. 211,000 tons. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's a billion dollar industry. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, uh, yeah, for beef, pig and sheep, it shows me and poultry, uh, 1.3 billion and a billion of that was was bovine meat. So you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> I'm relative to the size of the, the, the island. The yeah, no, exactly. Even, yeah. Even though agricultural employment has gone from 30% in the 1960s to about 4% at the moment. Now, that is people engaged directly in agriculture. So the, the size of, the, of uh, agriculture in the overall workforce uh, is relatively small compared to what it used to be so we you can you can see in those figures that we've moved from being a largely agricultural economy to one that's based much more on kind of high-tech industries we have the high-tech industries all here we have intel for example uh, which produces uh, a huge proportion of the world's microchips which is uh, uh, based in, it's near Dublin here, but it, it, it was built it was built on what was a stud farm, yeah, and it now takes up it takes up the same uh, footprint and size of a small town, uh, oh. and uses all of the kind of excess water from Dublin. Any kind of excess water that's available, just the size of this thing, it uses up a huge volume of, of water uh, just to just to produce microchips. Uh, so you, that's the kind of uh, shift that's happened here in 30 years, a huge transformation from kind of an agricultural economy to a, you know, uh, you know, having a very, very high tech, high tech industry. Uh, we, 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 we didn't, we didn't have a, a, any kind of a scale of industrial revolution here. Uh, industrialization really only began in the 1960s. And so we, because we entered late, we entered at a higher level. We entered at the kind of more higher tech level, yeah. Um, and uh, so that's produced great wealth on the, on the one hand, but also lots of kind of polarization on the other hand, yeah. Uh, and lots of change, you know, um, in the way in which land is used, used, and the way in which, uh, you know, the way in which the the, the Spatially, we're using, you know, using cities and towns. They're all integrated into this kind of more globalized production now, uh, as opposed to agriculture. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know where we're going with that. But <laughs> no, well, I've got a, you made me go down a rabbit hole of my own. I didn't know this. <laughs> a a rabbit hole here. <laughs> Ireland is the, the fifth largest uh, net exporter of beef in the world. I didn't realize it had such a large well, per capita, uh, I presume. A per capita, I presume. It's such a small country. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, and you know, compared to compared to somewhere like Australia, which is a continent, you know. Yeah, fair enough. 
Just a, a little a little detour um, for for those uh, who are listening and watching. Uh, Bat and myself are the co-editors of the Bristol University Press uh, series Research in Rural Crime, and our very first. Uh, the first book in the series is going to be called Rural Transformations, really getting, touching on some of those issues around how rural spaces are transforming. And I just wonder, I know that you're in the throes of, of writing your essay with um, your PhD student, Arta Pichlarts, at the moment. And I'm just wondering whether you could take us through some of the thinking and the conceptualisation behind the essay that you're uh, writing. A, a taster for uh, the audience when they, uh, when they get to buy a copy or access a copy uh, in 2022. We've been we've been trying to write uh, about uh, security in rural areas at a time when a lot of the institutions that secured rural areas are in decline. Uh, so, for example, the closure of police stations, the closure of banks. You know, commercial, commercial and everyday banking was critical, critical to rural life and people trading in, agri, you know, agricultural products and so on and, you know, selling a cow. I mean, you could go down to the local bank and put your cash in the bank. Uh, that, that's no longer available to people. It's, it's, it's less and less available. So we have, we have, that. We have also things like state run institutions like the post office, uh, you know, also a critical rural institution, you know, uh, yeah. the focal point of, 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 of social life for a lot of people uh, when they go to, uh, uh, you know, do their business in the post office. They're also, they've also been uh, drastically cut back over the last few years. Uh, public health services have also been rationalised. Uh, so the very institutions that held up and secured rural uh, rural communities are themselves in, in decline. And, that's typical of uh, what we've seen in uh, in uh, thinking theoretically about it in late the, in late modern society. We see this as you know the the uh, to use Zygmunt Bauman's phrase. We see that there's a there's a li liquefaction of rural institutions. That the, the, the rural solid institutions are beginning to kind of become more fluid. Yeah. Or uh, they're, they're certainly not as they're, they're not as solid as they were, and these were foundational, I think, to sustaining rural communities. So that's a that's a taster of what we're trying to do with. Uh, uh, were they ever uh, really uh, there? Uh, Bay Britain? Were they ever really there? I mean, I know you know the discussions in Canada, especially in in Australia, is that there's that's almost a, developed a kind of rural stoicism and and you know just a, a you know survive on your own kind of mentality because those services have just never been around and i wonder if it's easier in a smaller yeah. country like yeah. ireland where you're not yeah. so out out bush and just in the middle of absolutely nowhere flying only communities kind of yeah. thing yeah they most definitely were there i mean mm. uh, the, the, uh, you know, every 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 village would have had a post office. Every village, well, certainly every every small, reasonably sized town would have had a bank. Um, um, every, every almost every village would have had some connection with a police station. Um, uh, there were there was a system. Uh, we closed the system of local hospitals a few years back and started creating centres of excellence. Mm -hmm. which means that people have to make very long trips to get to a hospital. Now, there are good reasons for that, I think, because of the way in which you have to centrally locate specialists. Uh, and there are, good, good, there are better outcomes for patients where you have you know, a large-scale hospital or a hospital operating at scale. But we did close these more localised, smaller hospitals that people had much more access to. Now... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know the, the 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 issue here really is, uh, you know, how do people feel about that? You know, how you know does that feel them make them feel more secure or less secure? Uh, and from what we see on the ground, it's this sense that you know we're being abandoned, uh, we're being left, to, we're being left to fend for ourselves or whatever, or mm. we're being asked to take much more responsibility for organising these kinds of services ourselves. Uh, I think it's also, a, it, it can also be a death by a thousand cuts, isn't it? So yeah, you, yeah, you, lose, yeah, yeah. you lose the local bank branch. Oh, well, you can go to the post office. Then the post office goes, 
uh, well, you can go to the general store. Then there's um, people are moving out and um, you know, all that real change, that real transformation. The football team, cl team closes down because all the young blokes are all moving to the city and, and all those little bits of incremental change uh, lead up to, you know, sort of almost the, the fracturing of those, those, um, those rural yep. communities. And, uh, yeah. and, and, and I, I guess it also gets back to some of those earlier convert, that earlier conversation we had about the urban rural divide, but we could also think about the digital divide too. And it springs to mind, a, oh, an anecdote that I saw, I think it was on, on Twitter, um, a little while ago, uh, a person, a social worker was helping a person had been released from prison in, in America and uh, had been, he'd been banged up for 30 years. And, um, you know, he was told, uh, you know, given some papers as he, as he left. And you know, the first thing he had to do was set up a Zoom meeting with his uh, parole officer. He said, what is this Zoom that you speak of? <laughs> I have no idea. He, for 30 years, he hadn't, um, he hadn't actually switched on a computer. So, I um, mean, some of those significant issues, and we can think about those in rural spaces too. Oh, we'll just log on and you can deal with all your stuff, but we don't have any broadband. Or if it does, it's so intermittent. If you're thinking about some of the really rural and remote parts of Australia, uh, yep. Canada, uh, yep. and the certain pockets of Europe, I suspect too, um, you know, you're really disenfranchising a whole group of people by this demand that you don't have to do bricks and mortar anymore. You don't have to do yep. personal interactions anymore. Yep. So I think, I think in terms of what we're trying to do with that chapter is to try and apply thinking about the, the concept of, uh, or using theories of modernity and how, how we might reflect on rural change mm. uh, uh, with a specific focus on rural crime prevention and rural security. Um, and our, I suppose our key into that has been some of Garland's ideas about responsabilization, the way in which people are being asked yeah. to take much more responsibility for protecting themselves. Mm. You know, so as the state begins to get smaller and smaller, individual households have to then uh, become much more safe for, yeah. and self-protecting. Uh, mm. And so we switch from a, uh, you know, a position where the state is involved in people's lives to these solid institutions. And it's somewhat almost easier to apply responsabilization in the rural context, because at least uh, we hear from farmers, they very much feel responsible. If you ask them who's responsible for farm crime, overwhelmingly, they put the onus on themselves, which I think is interesting, you know, and so that, 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 that notion of responsibilization is much easier applied than in, I think, an urban context where, well, where are the police? You know, why, why weren't the police here? You know, they're just down the street and you have an expectation of security because it's all around you. Here, I can't believe, I mean, I've lived in semi-rural spaces, but Armadale's kind of, you know, it's got the university, so it has everything you need, but it's really out there. And the amount of kind of crimes that occur by proxy of opportunity, which, you know, you never really considered in a busy rural environment, but ram raids and things like that, you know, just driving your car through a window and taking a few bikes out of the local uh, bike shop and stuff like that. It's just, um, yeah, it's just interesting when all that, those dynamics come together and feed into crime in rural spaces. Um, can't give too much away, you know. Can't give, you know. Can't give too much away, Alistair. No, you don't want to give it. Someone will write that paper before you get it in. <laughs> I'm still. Uh, it's but, actually. Yeah. Still, <laughs> um, we're going to be a week late at least. So. <laughs> uh, luckily, as an editor, you uh, you get special dispensation to a degree, don't, don't you? Don't, don't put that out there. You know, everybody has to get <laughs> stuff. You know. Don't uh, don't be giving that. Don't give them that idea. Put you know, that, superiority. Put that. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, I can say from a personal perspective, I'm starting to feel the tyranny of distance. I got to drive 12 hours to see a specialist. In what world? I know. Like they just don't have it. You got to go to Brisbane or Sydney, and it's six hours either side of Armadale. So I'm starting to turn into that grumpy old farmer, I think, because I'm all bitter that I can't just go down to my local hospital. Like, we can't, we can't uh, perceive of that, of that kind of space here it's just us we're just in a small island driving for yeah. 12 hours you know you'd, you'd have circumnavigated the island at that stage you know yeah i know well yeah my partner's from the netherlands and you can <laughs> top the bottom in about four hours here. right yeah it's amazing i think matt and i worked out on a, in a previous conversation that um the distance from um 
uh, where I currently live and where I work is the yeah. same distance from Dublin to Frankfurt. <laughs> yeah. so Travelling through uh, two countries and across the English Channel or something. I know. Like that, isn't it? So. When I lived in the Netherlands and I drive to the UK, we'd go from Netherlands to Belgium to France to, to uh, Canterbury in the UK in five and a half hours. It's going to take me six hours just to get out of the, the state into Queensland. You know, it's just, uh, yeah. Scale is... Yeah. It's, Europe, uh, yeah. We have, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we have very good roads here now. It was a t- I mean, that's another factor here, you know, the fact that we have yeah. these roads. I mean, one of the changes, one of the big changes in, in spatial changes in Ireland in the last 20 years has been the proliferation of motorways. And it has led directly to, we don't have any kind of research or data on this, but you could see how it's led to greater access and egress for mobile criminals. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that's, that's what it is alleged drove the spate of, uh, of rural attacks and rural crimes that piqued our interest originally in, 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 in rural crime. And it's, it's to do with what Manuel Castells called the flow, you know, the creation of the space of flows that, as as informational capitalism takes hold, uh, it, flow systems are become much more prominent. Whether it's flows of information or flows of people, uh, or yeah. and flows of goods and flows of capital, and drugs. And yeah. So, quite the creating roads, the linking places together, linking nodes, if you like, together, mm. and just much more kind of networked based notion of space. Uh, has has had huge effects here in terms of access and egress for people to rural areas. Uh, yeah. And uh, again, something that we're t- t- something that we're we're theorising about, but we haven't done kind of a hell of a lot of research about. It. And I think that's something we we would do. I mean, one of the things, one of the interesting things about our size size apart, right, is that it is one of the most globalised societies in the world. Uh, it, it industrialized late and so it was able to hit at a higher level uh, uh, um, a higher value level yeah uh, uh, it uh, it's geo it's geolocation it's space right it's where where it actually is in the world it's a, literally yeah. a bridge between uh, America and Europe uh, yeah. it's English speaking it's got kind of everything going for it in terms of you know, if you wanted to put a European headquarters anywhere for your American corporation or your Japanese corporation, where would you put it? You know, put it in Dublin and put it in Ireland somewhere because, uh, uh, you know, it gives you access to the European market. Uh, uh, you have an English speaking workforce, generally well educated. Uh, and uh, you, you, the, the government gives you incentives to do so. Um, mm. And you know it's been a it's a it's been a miracle you know in in many ways um not, i'm not saying that doesn't create divisions of course it creates divisions but it sets off a particular pattern of development uh and it integrates rural areas in different ways than it might say in scotland say or in maybe even in places like the netherlands yeah yeah so that's not just about it, to say i haven't large... spent uh much time in, in Ireland. I was visited Temple Bar and the Guinness factory and that's about it. But a lot of what you're saying is, is parallels in the Netherlands that kind of, you know, agrarian past and really rapid, fast adjustment and necessity. Uh, my understanding is by proxy of having zero natural resources to become a global market and a global economy very rapidly. No, you won't find a person in the Netherlands that doesn't speak English. I remember pulling up on the side of the road once some farmer, uh, yeah. an axle off his yeah. truck fell off or something. I stopped to give him a hand thinking, oh, this is going to be a funny conversation. And uh, I start talking in English and just repeats back to must have been like 80 years old, back to me in perfect English. You know, and I just was, it was, uh, yeah, when my, I wasn't in the Netherlands for that long, but I remember being taken back by, wow. And then all the universities teaching in English and you can just see the reason for that is to yeah. present, to, to, to present their youth to the world or their future workers to the world as, as global they become, citizens. And they become, they become mobile. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. By, by, by necessity. Yeah. yeah. I think Ireland is, you know, the point I think I was leading was Ireland is a laboratory for, you know, looking at what happens. And how does globalization and, and in, informational capitalism 
transform a country, transform a space, and transform all the social relations around that. Uh, and how does it then kind of integrate different types of spaces, uh, urban and rural? Uh, I, I think you know, I mean, Ireland is a, is a great is a great uh, laboratory for that. So we we can speak to global themes. Then you know what I mean. We can, if you have a case of something happening in Ireland. It, it, it has potential global reach because people are interested in the same process and how it might transform an island in the Pacific or a region in Australia or uh, or somewhere like Tasmania or wherever. You know, it, it, it may, it, you know, it, it acts as a laboratory for, or as a, you know, as a case laboratory for, uh, for dealing with very, very, glo- you know, very global themes. Uh, yeah. I think that's the approach that uh, Arthur and I take in the work that we do. That we we can actually look at how the low the global has penetrated the local, and therefore we can we can reflect back on the global, yeah, in doing mm. so. Uh, which I think is part of the kind of an implicit kind of part of the methodology that we're using, you know. Um, uh, that even if it, even if it is just it just sounds like a case, but it's actually a case dealing with globally applicable themes. I think, yeah, I think this brings us full circle too to that notion of local context uh, uh, and kind of localization of the rural. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, yeah. and how the rural yeah. is different, and yeah. much of that is yeah. dependent upon yeah. history um, yeah. and and fast forwarding to the future context. I mean, yeah. hearing about Ireland, I would have never considered all of those elements. That's that's very fascinating, yeah. and how yeah. that would create a specific Irish rurality, a blend of history and modernity. Um, um, yeah, 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 very interesting. Nice way putting it. I, I learned to, 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 to think a lot of this way from my PhD supervisor, who is Robert, was Robert Holton, Robert, Robert J. Holton, or Bob, Bob, Bob Holton. And he spent most of his working life in Australia. And around about 2000, he became a professor of sociology at Trinity College Dublin, where I was one of his first PhD students. So. And he's since gone back to Australia. So uh, uh, he's a fellow at, at Deakin. Yeah. Mm. Adelaide, I think. Uh, but he, he was, he, he, he worked. No, he, uh, he, close he, enough. <laughs> so I learned to think, he's a, he's, his, his scholarship was around globalization. That's what he, he, he was one of the founder members of the journal Global Networks. Uh, and he uh, has written on cosmopolitanism, the globalization of cricket. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It is, uh, uh, is one, of his, one of his most famous books is this one here, The Globalization of the Na- Nation State. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I learned that from him. You know, mm. I learned to think that way from, from him. Yeah, yeah. That's great. So, yeah, 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 the, 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 even though he's originally British, like he, his, <clears> his, <throat> a, a lot of his thinking I think was 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 uh, you know developed in, in Australia and uh, uh, so he was he was a, he was able to think on this kind of global scale you know and uh, you know that's that's that, I think that that's implicit in the methodology that I use that when I'm when I'm talking about something that's happening in a very kind of local parochial sort of area here in, in Ireland that we're actually dealing with processes that are happening on this much larger scale yeah it, a lot of the things that you've brought up though, i've just never thought i mean i know them very well responsabilization thesis and you know the bauman's liquid modernity but i just never thought to even consider them in the rural so it's it is really fascinating to hear hear these because uh, they make total sense you know when you think about it in that context but uh yeah i think cr- uh, rural criminology can kind of uh, benefit a lot from going back and and looking at a lot of these things through the lens of of morality. Yep, definitely. Even writings on populism and stuff that we're doing now that are typically you know geared towards the urban populations and things like that. It's it's just really fascinating, interesting things. Yeah, it's been a um a terrific conversation. I think we covered a fair bit of ground there today, Carl. Yeah. 
That's what I meant by by shooting the shit. See, you just <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it just it. goes. Yeah. Oh. Helps when you have a good uh, uh, guest. Yeah, it certainly <laughs> does. It certainly does. Yeah. Well, uh, let's uh, let's all thank um, Matt Bowden for um, um, participating today in our uh, in our podcast podcast series. You can find this on Spotify, Apple, and also on our uh, Santa's YouTube channel. Um, make sure that you stay tuned because we have a lot of guests lined up as we come along with a number of different products for your uh, listening and watching enjoyment. So longer length um, conversations like this one, but we're also um, engaging and going to start um, offering to you some snapshot series. So just really short, sharp um, snapshots of uh, people involved in rural criminological research uh, the world over. So a range of, uh, a range of things for you to, uh, to listen to, download, um, put, in the, uh, put in the earphones as you're taking the dog for a walk or driving the tractor and, um, and we'll have that join us on the, uh, for the next one.